Welcome to video one for week eight. In this video, I want to talk about the interaction of vector fields with two-dimensional objects. We've already talked about the interaction of vector fields with one-dimensional objects, for which we used parametric curves. And the interaction there was thinking about an object moving through the influence of a vector field, an object with the force acting upon it moving through a fluid where the vector field describes the flow of the fluid. And you could work with, or if you work against, you could go crosswise. And we had the, the tangent of the parametric curve, and the dot product of the vector field is the thing that controlled that interaction. Now, instead of having an object moving through a field along the curve, I want to think of a field passing through some kind of net or membrane, which I'm going to describe as a two-dimensional surface. You can think about this as questions like, well, how much fluid passes through a certain net or grate in a situation over a period of time? The interpretation for force is a little bit less direct, but is actually quite important as well, how much of a field of force is passing through a certain membrane or a certain net. And that, that interpretation will be quite important a couple weeks from now. But I, I still want to be able to describe this kind of interaction. For the one-dimensional situation, I needed a parametric object. I needed a parametric curve. Just a locus wasn't enough, because I needed the notion of movement along the curve. The same is true for two-dimensional objects. And to that end, I'm going to now define the two-dimensional version of a parametric curve, which is a parametric surface. So this is going to be like surfaces we've seen before. We've seen lots of different two-dimensional objects, but now with a parametric description. So the setup is this. I start on a simply connected set in R2. Previously, for parametric curves, I started on an interval. Interval is simply connected. There are no holes in it. You go from A to B. Here, we're not going to have a single direction because we have two dimensions, but we want to start with a set with no holes in it so that we get a parameterization that is, is sort of one connected surface with no gaps in it. So I'm going to start with a simply connected set in R2, and I'm going to have a function that goes from that set into some Rn. And this function must be continuous, and that's going to be my definition of a parametric surface. It's just going to be a continuous function from a two-dimensional simply connected set, the same way that a parametric curve was just a continuous function from an interval, a one-dimensional simply connected set. We're basically going to work with R3 all of the time. The definition works in Rn, but many of the constructions we're going to do in this course and in these videos will only work in three dimensions, and the applications I care about are only applications in three dimensions. So I'm going to restrict to just R3 and talk about surfaces. I'm going to use sigma to refer to these the same way I use gamma to refer to curves. So sigma, u and v are typical parameters. I have two parameters now instead of one, so I don't have a parameter t, which is time. I do think of this more in terms of movement in two different directions. And in R3, I have three components of this. So this outputs the x-coordinate, this outputs the y-coordinate, and this outputs the z-coordinate. And I think of this like I think of parametric curves, is I'm not really going to see u and v axes I'm going to think about the parametric surface sitting in R3 with its x and y and z coordinates that depend and change based on the values of u and v. So let me do a bunch of examples. The examples are mostly going to be parametric descriptions of previously studied objects. Most of the surfaces we need to study are things we actually already have seen. Uh, spheres, cylinders, cones, ellipsoids, graphs, things that we've already contacted in R3 before as two-dimensional objects, and I want parametric descriptions of them. In Calculus 3, we talked about the graph of the scalar field. So if we had a section in R2, and over top of that we had some kind of function, had some kind of graph, we thought about that as an altitude map. It had some kind of height. Uh, and this was a good interpretation sort of in the z-axis for the output of the graph of the function. I would now like to treat that as a parametric surface. And this is nice because the domain in R2 of the function can act also as the parameter domain, which means that the first two coordinates of the parametric surface are just u and v. I just have the x and y coordinates. I'm just renaming them u and v in the parameters. And then the height is the value of the function. That's what a graph meant. That meant that each point on this graph had the height equal to the value of the function. So this is a parametric description of the graph of the scalar field. Notice these are very, very similar, but this is a function that starts on a domain in R2 and outputs the mean in R1. It just outputs the height. 
This is something that starts in R2 and outputs all three dimensions. So each point's here. I'm going to output the x coordinate, the y coordinate, and the z coordinate. It's a subtle difference, but an important difference to give a parametric description of the graph of the scalar field. I also define surfaces of revolution. So this is when I had a, uh, a graph in R2, so a graph of a single variable function, f from a, b to r. And I thought about this as something that was spun around the axis, like you would spin something around a lathe to get these kind of vase-shaped objects that always have circular uh, cross sections, and these are surface of revolution. So I take this, spin it around the x-axis, uh, get something in three-dimensional. This is a surface. I would like to describe this surface as a parametric surface. And the parameters I'm going to use here, instead of using u and v, since I'm spinning around the x-axis and the x-axis is going to stay as the x-axis, it's going to be outputted to exactly the same thing. I will use x as the parameter here. That's a bit tricky because we have an x in the output and we have an x in the input. input. But we do do it frequently enough when the output and the input match up so that this parameter really is just the x-coordinate in the output. The second parameter is the angle. So I think about these circles in this cross-section. I can think about an angle going around those circles. And I'm going to call this state instead of calling it u or v just to indicate that this should be an angle. And whenever we're dealing with angles, we'll often call the parameters theta or phi because those are conventional Greek letters that we use for angles. So the output is the function, but then spun around a circle. Cos theta, sine theta are the parameters for parameterization of the circle. So that makes sense. So we get the function in the y and the function in the z with this spinning around a circle so that we get these circular cross sections of the surface revolution. That's the parametric description of a surface revolution. I'm going to do the sphere as well, and I'm basically going to copy spherical coordinates by treating the parameters as longitude and co-latitude, longitude going from 0 to 2 pi, latitude going from 0 to pi. This is an interval, and interval is simply connected, so that's a valid domain for a parametric surface. And then for a fixed radius, capital R, I can describe a point by describing its latitude, or its longitude and its co-latitude in exactly the same form as I had for spherical coordinates. And this gives me a spherical, or a parameterization of the sphere of fixed, fixed radius, capital R. I can do the same thing for the cylinder, basically copying cylindrical coordinates. So I can have an angle and a height, uh, again giving me an interval in R2 as the domain, and interval is simply connected, so it's a valid domain. And then I have a fixed radius R, and copying cylindrical coordinates. The height Z is just Z, I'll use Z as the parameter for that. And then I just go around a circle in X and Y, with cos theta, sine theta, giving me a parameterization of the cylinder in the parameters theta and z. And I could adjust that to parameterize a cone, same domain, so the same height of the cone and the same parameter of theta going around the circle. The only difference now is that as I go up the cone, the radius should decrease. So previously for the cylinder, just this was just a fixed radius r. I now want the radius to decrease linearly to be zero at the top. And if you figure out what linear function you need that starts at capital R at the bottom and gets to zero at the top when we've gone up a height h, it's exactly this linear function, r h minus z over h. And so that linear, linear decrease in radius will give me these smaller radii as I go up the cone. And I just have the height, so again, z is the, the parameter I use going up the height, and theta is the parameter I use going around the circle. Z now shows up here because I want to know how far up I am on the cone in order to have these smaller circles. This gives me a parametric, parametric description of the cone. 